Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fifth installment of our nursing home training series, PPE Strategies for COVID Care. My name is Sophia Autry. I'm Deputy Director of the Division of Community and Population Health, and I'm excited to welcome our speakers today for this discussion, Dr. Jane Brock and Sherry Longacre from Telligen. I want to add that Angel Davis, the QIO Nursing Home Task Lead, will be facilitating with me today. And we also want to thank our CDC colleague, Dr. Kara Jacobs-Sliska, for joining us and collaborating on the call, as well as being available to answer any questions. Next slide. Oh, I'm here. Dr. Jane Brock is the Medical Director of Telogen, and Sherry is the Senior Quality Improvement Facilitator of Telogen. Dr. Brock spent a number of years in clinical practice in urgent care and occupational medicine, and Mrs. Longacre received both her bachelor and master's of science degree in nursing education from Southern Nazarene University. Mrs. Longacre has extensive experience in critical care education, quality reporting, and quality improvement in long-term care in Critical Access Hospital. Sherry has over 23 years of nursing experience as a registered nurse, but has shared that her heart belongs to improving quality care for our senior population. Dr. Brock, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sophia, and uh, welcome everybody uh, to this um, session on PPE strategies for COVID care. And yes, I am Jane Brock. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. So for those who are not familiar with Telgen, we are the Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization for Iowa, Colorado, Illinois, and Oklahoma. We are contracted with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to provide you all with technical assistance and support at no cost, and we do this through Telgen QI Connect. We are currently in our open enrollment period for Telgen QI Connect, so if you are not already enrolled in our quality improvement uh, program, we thank you in advance for your consideration of, of partnering with us. Um, while Telgen QI Connect is unique to those that are in our four-state region, um, rest assured that um, everyone has a QIO in their state that would love to provide you also with no-cost assistance. And you can find your state QIO through this link at the bottom of the page, and I believe we repeat that link later. So next slide. Here are our objectives today. So essentially, we are going to provide an overview of the why, what, and how of PPE use, and then open it up to your questions and answers from our experts. Next slide. Um, for a little context, this is the New York Times COVID-19 prevalence map, which is updated daily, and I might say makes the list of most read articles <laughs> from the New York Times and has for four months a year ago. Who would have imagined that epidemiological mapping would be the most popular article at the New York Times? Um, the, the point to this, though, is until recently, you know, you hear a lot about what COVID cases in the U.S. are doing, whether they're going up or down, and they were going down until very recently. But this map is, um, I think, especially useful because the real story of COVID transmission and therefore risk within your facility is extremely local. So this, this is a view of the map that shows the rate of change in cases over the past 14 days by county, and they're color-coded to highlight the places where transmission rates are high. So I would encourage really anyone working in a healthcare setting to frequently review and rely on local trends data, and specifically if you work in a long-term care facility to understand the risks to your facility. Um, overall, you know, the U.S. has had about 2.5 million cases, and um, more than 260,000 of those have been among nursing home residents and staff. And there's been uh, more than 51,000 deaths in nursing homes or 40% of the deaths. So really the point to this map is um, this is not a time for anybody to be letting their guard down. This is a time to double down on infection control practices, including scaling up um, and train your training and auditing in PPE use. So next slide. So personal protective equipment is just specialized clothing or equipment to protect employees against job-related health risks. 
in healthcare environments, uh, clearly an, an obvious and common risk is exposure to infectious agents. So the definition of PPE that we are talking about today is technically a non-disease specific barrier to penetration of infectious substances, including solid, liquid, or airborne particles. Next slide. So when, you, when you're working in a room with a COVID infected patient, staff need to protect themselves from the active respiratory droplets coming from the patient, um, the surfaces where all of those droplets may have come to rest which you have to assume is every surface and object in the room. And then, of course, you need to protect uh, against carrying contaminants out of the room with you um, on your hands, face, or clothing. So full PPE properly used is effective in preventing COVID transmission, including transmission to healthcare workers. So uh, the reason I point that out is, you know, there's been so many highly publicized stories about rates of infection in healthcare workers, which, of course, there is a significant rate of that. Um, but even among the most highly exposed, like ED workers and staff that actually perform intubations, um, among those using PPE, the transmission rates are, are a relatively small um, fraction um, when, they, uh, when PPE is used in the way that's intended to be used. Improper use is what's associated with increased risk, and, and common risks include poorly fitted N95 respirators and self-contamination during doffing. So just a, a word about surgical masks. They are effective at reducing inhalation exposures due to large droplets, but they are not intended for protection during aerosolizing procedures like intubation or nebulizer treatments. Um, one of their main functions is to protect others from your own respiratory droplets, which is why they're often required now for participation in society, including being in a long-term care facility. So next slide. So knowing something and practicing it uh, are two different things. That is the heart and soul quality improvement, of course. Um, and following the QAPI methods uh, will help both improve and sustain PPE compliance. Proper use of PPE is not no, new, we know, to nursing home staff, but PPE compliance deficiencies are still being discovered and COVID infections are spreading. So the QAPI methods ensure that not only is your facility complying with PPE standards, but that your process will lead to ongoing improvement as needed. Um, PP audits, which we are gonna talk about today, are especially important so that you have the data that you need to detect gaps early and resolve them quickly. These steps, um, I believe, are probably familiar and no doubt in use in your facility for many improvement activities. So this, this training session is to refresh everybody with their application to PPE use for protection of both uh, patients and your staff. Um, and once again, here's the link to, to uh, finding your QIO if you uh, would like assistance with um, ramping up your QAPI program for PPE use. So now for the real meat of this presentation, I would like to turn it over to Sherry Longacre. Sherry, are on? Thank you, Dr. Brock. Hello, everyone. My name is Sherry Longacre, and I'm the Senior Quality Improvement Facilitator at Telogen. I started out as a CNA in a nursing home back in the 1980s and we have seen a significant improvement in PPE use over the years. Today, I'm going to visit with you about proper use of PPE as well as tools and strategies to ed educate your clinical and ancillary staff. We will also share some best practices that nursing homes have shared with us to assist with you during this unprecedented time. Next slide. So just a brief introduction to types of PPE that we utilize daily. As Dr. Brock stated, PPE is used by healthcare professionals to protect themselves, residents, and others when providing care. And I know this is not news to you, but gloves are the most common types of PPE that is used in healthcare settings. And all of these types of PPE serve to help to protect and to keep us safe, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. So based upon the CDC guidelines, PPE is to be used every day by all healthcare personnel to protect themselves, residents, and others when providing care. And this also includes activities directors, environmental services, dietary, your admin staff, hospice, all of the consultants that come in as well. Um, residents can and should wear a face mask or cloth covering for universal source control when out of the room. And cloth face coverings are not considered PPE 
and if face masks are limited, they should be reserved for staff. CDC also provides guidance to not place a mask on anyone that is having problems breathing or anyone who is unconscious, incapacitated, or otherwise unable to remove the mask without assistance. Next slide. So just know that this will provide an opportunity to educate new staff and staff that need a refresher in proper PPE use as well, or possibly family members in the building for a compassionate visit. A step-by-step -step process should be developed and used during training and resident care, and should be included in policies and procedures with compliance audits. This process includes, but is not limited to, Incorporating your hand hygiene in the policy, it always needs to be performed before donning and after stopping. PPE must be donned correctly before entering the resident area. And also, PPE must remain in place and be worn correctly for the duration of work in potentially contaminated areas. PPE should not be adjusted, such as retying your gown or adjusting your respirator or your face mask during resident care. And PPE must always be removed slowly and deliberately in a sequence, and that will help prevent self-contamination as well. And also, um, during this time, having a PPE buddy system in case assistance is needed during your donning or doffing. A step-by-step step, step process should be developed and used during training and resident care. And then, of course, utilize an audit and feedback tool to monitor staff compliance. Next slide. So in order to identify the proper PPE, let's first review just a few things regarding our standard precautions, which are used for all resident care. And this is based upon our risk assessment and makes use of common sense practices and personal protective equipment used that protect healthcare providers from infection and also the preventive spread of infection from resident to resident. So an example of this would be such as emptying a Foley bag. There is a risk of splash or spray. So in this instance, you would choose your PPE that is based upon potential exposure. And then there is transmission-based precautions, which are the second tier of basic infection control and are to be used in addition to the standard precautions for residents who may be infected or colonized with certain infectious agents for which additional precautions are needed to prevent that infection transmission. So make a plan for residents who are exhibiting COVID-19 symptoms and implement the use of transmission-based precautions. Next slide. Because this is such a critical component in the first line defense from spreading infection, we are going to take a few minutes and review the proper process of donning your PPE. So first of all, let's gather all of our supplies and ensure that the gown size is correct. And just a little tip, it's okay to wear one on the front and on the back if needed. Always perform your hand hygiene and make sure and tie all of the ties on the gown. And this is where your PPE buddy will be able to assist. Choose your N95 or face mask if not available. And if the respirator has a nose piece, it should be fitted to the nose with both hands, not bent or tinted. The respirator, the face mask should be extended underneath your chin and both your mouth and nose should be protected. Do not wear your respirator or your face mask underneath your chin or store in your scrub pocket between your residents. And next, we're going to choose eye protection, face shields or goggles. And select the one that does not fit, affect the fit or the seal of the respirator. The face shields need to provide full face coverage. And the goggles are also just excellent protection for your eyes. Next, we're going to put on your gloves. And the gloves should cover the cuff of the gown. Okay, so now we went through all the steps and now you're ready to enter the residence room. So just be aware of your surroundings and what you're touching when you're going into the room. Next slide. 
So we're moving on to, do to doffing, an equally important process. And we're going to ensure that our glove removal does not add additional contamination of the hand. Always untie all the ties. And some of the gowns can be broken rather than untied, but if you're doing that, just do so in a gentle manner, avoiding, avoiding a forceful movement. And you're going to just reach up to the shoulders and carefully pull down the gown, and down and away from the body, and just rolling the gown down and then disposing in the trash. After exiting the room, the first thing we're going to do is perform our hand hygiene and then carefully removing our face shield or goggles. Do not touch the front of the face shield or the goggles as you're taking them off. After removing the and discarding the respirator, do not touch the front of the respirator or the face mask. And then you're always going to perform your hand hygiene after removing. A few, just a few key points that I want to point out that we've touched base on is that you're always going to don your PPE before entering the room and minimizing what you're touching and carefully removing and discarding your PPE at the doorway and then immediately performing hand hygiene after removal of the PPE. Next slide. So some of these are common sense, but let's just do a quick review of the face mask do's and don'ts. So we're always going to use good hand hygiene. And don't wear your face mask under your nose or your mouth or around your arm or on top of your head. And we know we've all seen some of these happen at some point in time. Next slide. So as we mentioned earlier, training is such an important component to setting your staff up for success. And a step-by-step -step process should be included in your policies and procedures with compliance audits. And don't forget to communicate with your team and continue to update if changes are made. Next slide. So now let's equip your nursing home for success. And since we have been working with the nursing home, we have found that one component is generally missing. And a quick way to assess training that needs to be included in the infection prevention and control program is by completing the CDC's infection prevention and control assessment tool for long-term care facilities. Facility-wide PPE training needs to be completed upon hire and within the past 12 months with the use of a PPE auditing tool with feedback. And this really allows for documentation of compliance and feedback. We generally find that rounds are being made and verbal feedback is being given, but it's just not documented. So this really helps you to complete that complete process. Next slide. The power of using an audit tool is to identify the gaps. And the auditing process allows us to get the true picture if the staff are competent and if additional training is needed. So the audit process consists of competency-based training followed by auditing with feedback. And the feedback, whether that be the just-in-time training or return demonstration, is now documented on your audit sheet. Since working with the nursing homes, we have identified auditing with feedback as an area most facilities are lacking and have not found a readily available resource to share with our nursing homes. Telogen has developed a tool, and I'm going to share it with you today. So I encourage you to please implement this in your nursing home to assist with identifying the gap. So now let's introduce the new tool and how it will benefit your facility. Next slide. Okay, now for the big reveal. The auditing that we have developed will allow you to close the gap and document the auditing with feedback process and we are currently using human-centered design to test this tool, but it is available and we will be sharing it with you today. Since we are a quality improvement organization, we are currently conducting a PDSA on this audit tool and we value your feedback, so please share with us. Next slide. So circling back to PPE, 
The infection preventionist needs to share the auditing and feedback results with the QAPI team. This will allow the team to be updated so a performance improvement plan can be started if needed. Next slide. Now I want to share some promising practices from your peers to help you be successful. And if you have some to share, please share with us as well. We'd love to hear what you're doing and what's working in your nursing home. Next slide. Some general tips are to use posters provided by the CDC for proper donning and doffing of PPE on the front and the back of the doors throughout your facility as a constant reminder to your staff and don't forget your PPE buddy. To create name badges for team members to mitigate the challenge of residents not seeing their faces. And to always clearly label all areas. Next slide. A few more tips regarding training and education are to have your staff fit tested properly with your N95 mask. An improper fit defeats the purpose of wearing the mask, and that's such a vital step. Your staff can use barrier cream to prevent chafing from continuous mask use. Some nursing homes have their staff change scrubs upon entry and exit of the nursing home facility to prevent spread into the nursing home and back into the community. And always remember to utilize your technology and to utilize apps to share information to your team, such as the CREW app is one that was suggested. And one infection preventionist shared that she uses a PPE audit tool that you can download in an Excel spreadsheet. And most of all, don't forget to make it fun for your staff, because one of our nursing homes played a game to engage the staff in PPE donning and doffing, and whoever put their PPE on the fastest and correctly was the winner because you know it all comes down we are all motivated by fun next slide i also want to review just a few things on your supply of your ppe and encourage you to keep a close eye on your ppe inventory and utilize the cdc's burn rate calculator and niosh ppe tracker app of course Developing relationships with your supply chain vendors and your state health department as well is so important. Next slide. CDC shared guidance on how to conserve PPE and first identify which strategy you should use based on the CDC guidelines and make PPE use decisions or alternatives based on the suggestions there, and to continue to evaluate the needs for PPE upon active cases and supply to determine to move from contingency capacity to crisis or back. Also to avoid stockpiling PPE and using at standard capacity. We certainly don't want anyone to run out rapidly or face a shortage either. Next slide. So I do have some resources that I want to share with you in order to help educate your staff on your uh, PPE. Next slide. There are some great resources from the CDC for this uh, resources and guidelines, including videos and also fact sheets and the posters in order to place for your staff on, um, in educating your staff. Next slide. So I'd like to thank CMS for the opportunity to join you today. We know your time is valuable and hope you heard at least one little tip that you'll be able to take back to your team and community. And also, please reach out to us. You can contact the Telogen Nursing Home team for questions or if you're in Oklahoma, Illinois, Iowa, or Colorado and would like to register for Telogen QI Connect, just send us an email with your name, email address, and job title, or go to our website at telogenqinqio.com, and you'll have immediate access to all future educational offerings. 
please know that we are here to support you and reach out if we can assist in any way. And with that, I will turn the presentation back over to Angel. Have a wonderful day, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you so much, Sherry, and to Dr. Brock for your wonderful presentation. Uh, so again, this is Angel Davis with CMS. We'd like for you to join us for our National Learning and Action Network event uh, to be held on Tuesday, June 30th from 2 to 3 p.m., and that's Eastern Time. So this event will provide an overview of the different activities and resources that the state healthcare associated infections and antibiotic resistance prevention, excuse me, prevention programs and quality innovation network quality improvement organizations are offering to assist nursing homes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so at this event, we will have uh, speakers from the CDC, uh, as well as the state HAI programs and our Quinn QIOs. I do want to mention that registration is limited, uh, but we certainly look forward uh, to having you join us. And now, next slide, I'm going to turn it over to Sophia to get us started with our uh, question and answer section. Sophia? Thank you, Angel. Just checking to see if you can hear me okay? We can. Okay, great, great. All right, I'm going to start uh, with the first question, um, and this is from Wendy Simmons. Um, this is for Kara. As a um, long-term care consultant, I'm asked about the frequency of COVID testing and the frustration it is causing the residents. Is there any guidance coming regarding flexibility in testing units, wings, rather than whole facility every three to seven days? Thank you for that. This is Kara. Um, so there, I, I will say that with, um, in terms of testing, a lot of the, um, the guidance that is coming out about testing is um, guidance that is somewhat collaborative. It is coming, you know, there is input coming from multiple different um, agencies, CMS, CDC, and input from others as well. Um, and I also just want to say that I recognize that it is, you know, the testing process itself um, and the frequency can feel overwhelming, and I, I definitely recognize and hear you that it is causing some frustration. I think that there are a couple of different reasons why testing may occur, um, and it's, in, it's important to um, put into context the, that reason behind the testing. So I think this, this question may be getting at the um, outbreak setting, um, although there may be testing also involved in the reopening process. And so I think in that outbreak setting, what we are really looking for and the reason there is that, um, that repetitive testing is to as quickly as possible identify individuals who were exposed before, had an exposure and there may have been transmission of SARS-CoV-2 before that was recognized, before that first individual was recognized and wanting to um, identify those individuals as quickly as possible to prevent further exposures. And so that is a part of why there is that, that repetitive testing. Um, but I would strongly recommend that in any situation like this, you involve your health department because they can work with you on determining um, the best approach for doing that testing. And in some situations, and this also depends on lab capacity and what is going on in your facility, there may be situations where testing in certain areas of the facility versus the whole facility would, would be appropriate. And then I will, lastly, I will just add that we um, are continuing to look at any data that is coming in, what we are learning, and there are definitely studies happening now looking at whether testing from other specimen sites have potential um, to be used in the future uh, that may be, um, less frustrating and less burdensome on the individual having the testing done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kara. So this question I'm going to pose to Sherry. So do you recommend completing the self-assessment with frontline staff to identify knowledge and practice gaps? 
Thank you so much. So I believe that the self-assessment is done with your team, definitely, because as we have seen, and you definitely get more buy-in, and also the true picture of what is going on with your facility when you are completing your self-assessment. So um, I would definitely um, complete it with your team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. So then I'm going to go to another question, and this is uh, for Kara again. Uh, for gowns, and this is from Susan Ayers, for gowns, can they be either disposable or cloth, or must they be disposable? So this is a question that will in part be informed by the supplies that you have and where you're at in terms of um, your uh, the strategies that you're able to use. And so this is going to depend on um, if you have, you know, do you have disposable gowns? Are you at a point where you are needing to um, reuse gowns or use gown alternatives? So in even at, um, even in conventional settings, even when you're at the sort of standard um, using your the typical pre-COVID strategies for using PPE, um, there are there are uh, reusable, launderable gowns that that can be used, and then there are disposable gowns, and so those are still appropriate. But I think what this question may be asking is, in situations where you do have limited use of gowns, what are alternatives, and uh, and what is appropriate? And so if you have access to um, to gowns that are not alternative cloth gowns or, or other gowns, and you should definitely go with trying to use those. However, um, you may not always have those options, and so you may need to use alternatives. And what we have seen is that in some situations, until the supply is increasing, um, people are needing to use alternatives and trying to cover the, the body, the arms, um, and still provide that barrier. However, these are often, um, these may be alternative materials that are not as resistant to fluids, um, and so you do have to be cautious with making sure they are laundered um, and, uh, and not reused if, if um, that is the case. Great, thank you, Kara. Uh, so the next question I'm gonna pose to the Telogen team. So would you be able to repeat which state the Telogen QI Connect resource is available to? Uh, this is Jane, I'd be happy to. Um, <laughs> Colorado, Illinois, Iowa, and Oklahoma. Thank you for asking. Thank you so Thank much, you, Jane. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is Sophia again. <laughs> I'm going to pose this other question, um, and this is from Kimberly Damaro from Beaumont Health Senior Services. Is wearing two surgical masks with a shield recommended for aerosolized procedures if an N95 is not available? And that can be posed to anyone. So this is Kara. One of the things that I can comment on is that we do recommend the use of an N95 or higher level respirator for aerosol generating procedures. Um, but we recognize that we don't have a fully comprehensive list of every single possible aerosol generating procedure. We definitely, there are some that we know um, can create aerosols, and so those are situations where we would recommend an N95 be, be used. There are others that may generate aerosols, and it's a little bit unclear um, how and how exactly what the what the risk there is um, for for healthcare personnel. Um, and so so our recommendation is that if you have N95 respirators, that you prioritize them for those procedures, or that you evaluate how those individuals can continue to be safely cared for if the aerosol generating procedure needs to be performed. Um, and that would definitely include making sure that you are reporting not having access to N95 um, and uh, are trying to get those supplies so that um, healthcare personnel are, are um, 
wearing able to wear that appropriate PPE for those procedures. All right, thank you, Kara. So uh, this is a follow-up question um, for Dr. Brock. So um, they are asking whether or not other states um, can access the Telogen tool. Um, yes, I'm sorry, I should have included that in my previous answer. Um, yes, uh, anybody can access this tool and we will, um, can we put in the chat link um, where, where they can find us? Yes, we can, absolutely. Okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brock. Um, I do have another question. We've been masking universally since March as the ICN. I had believed in source control, but we have a current outbreak widespread throughout the facility. And the question they have is, is there, a new is there new data about possible increases in the spread from droplets? And this is for you, uh, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so it sounds like uh, it sounds like from this question um, there. It sounds like this question um, you are asking about um, whether there is a change potentially in transmission. And I um, I think the important thing here is that we know that we we use PPE and we try to prevent. Um, we use PPE to try to prevent transmission of pathogens. Um, we know that the use of PPE, the way that PPE is used, how PPE is donned and doffed, whether hand hygiene is performed, all of these, um, all of these things are very important. And so I would make sure in those settings when you are seeing spread despite the use of PPE that, that you, um, are focusing on trying to make sure that um, that staff are comfortable um, in using that PPE. That that you are trying is as challenging as it can be in the middle of an outbreak setting to um, to be doing things like auditing and training, especially when PPE supply is so low. But that those things are being looked at because it is it can be very easy for staff when they when they are exposed to you know, so much of this pathogen when, when the, um, there are individuals who are positive, it, it can be very easy to contaminate the PPE you're wearing and potentially contaminate yourself or spread that, be involved in transmission to other residents. And so um, no, no data on, uh, on any change in how this is spread, but just the knowledge that even um, that this can be spread through those um, droplets and from, you know, person to person, but also potentially through surfaces. And so it's very, very important to make sure that the PPE you do have um, is being used properly and that hand hygiene is being performed. And just adding to that, that access to being able to perform hand hygiene is, is so important. Great. Thank you so much, Kara. Uh, so this question I'll, I'll pose to the team and certainly anyone feel free to jump in. Uh, if we are going back to the conventional use in order to move through the phases, will staff be without masks in hallways between rooms? This is this is Kara again, and others feel free, feel free to um, to to add to this. But if we um, go back to conventional use of PPE or sort of the standard use of PPE, right now the recommendation is still that you would be wearing a face mask um, as universal source control. Um, so that, that recommendation is slightly different than the optimizing PPE recommendations because that is specifically about source control. And that is actually the piece where you are protecting others from you. Um, so that the wearing a face mask at all times while you are um, in a face mask or potentially a cloth face covering, depending on your role in the facility and whether you're providing resident care, um, will continue just regardless of where you're at in terms of your PPE supply. 
Thank you so much, Kara. Um, the next question is, if staff are wearing an N95 for source control, is it appropriate to put a surgical mask over the top of the N95 mask for step number four? And that can be so there is, one. Yeah, and this is, uh, this is Kara. I was going to add that there is some information, um, there is some information specific to this um, on, uh, I believe, either the NIOSH or OSHA website where, where they have commented on, you know, this would not be a standard practice that would be recommended. However, um, however, having that or even using a face shield to help cover your N95, since um, with limited supplies that the extended use is happening in many, many places across the country, um, doing something like that um, is not is 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 allowable or is not inappropriate to do. Um, and not something that would typically be recommended, but they do describe that as as um, something that can be done in the current uh, situation to help with that extending the use process of the the respirator. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, I want to give Kara a break, but <laughs> I'm going to ask her to respond to this next question as well. Uh, so someone stated, first of all, excellent presentation. I was wondering if you recommend a smell test to ensure that the N95 masks are sealed. Um, they're asking whether there are any brands of particular barrier cream that you have seen uh, utilized. I, um, can you repeat the last part of that question? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Are there any brands of barrier cream that you have seen utilized? So I, I'm, I'm not certain about the last part of the question, but going back to the, um, the, the smell tester, I think, I think what, the, what they're asking is, a, is about fit testing. Um, and so, yes, Fit testing is recommended for um, N95 use. It is recommended that you, ideally, that you have a respiratory protection program, which we recognize the vast majority of long-term care facilities. That's not a normal piece of, of what we have done pre-COVID. Um, but it is recommended that fit testing is performed, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, as is men was mentioned in the question, is to get that, that seal, to ensure that you have the right fit, um, but it's also to assess um, uh, to assess uh, medically that someone is safe and comfortable with wearing that N95 respirator. Um, and so that is important now because of the fact that we are in this pandemic and supplies have been limited and, and access to fit, test, fit testing has been limited as well. Um, there are some um, um, allowances that, uh, that have that uh, NIOSH has described um, in their um, in some of their recommendations in terms of fit testing, and we also recognize that when supply is coming and you don't know what the next, you know, you might have one N95 respirator and the next week have a different brand. It's really really challenging to keep up with that, but that is definitely the ideal that you would have fit testing performed, um, which is that it is often sort of a smell or taste um, component to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kara. So I do have another question um, from Myrna Green at Eckert Living Center. Does the face shield substitute for the mask in long-term care? We have to volunteer. We have a volunteer who comes in for bingo with a resident, wears gloves and face shield, no mask. I feel he needs to wear the mask along with the face shield. Yes, so our recommendation right now is that everyone um, should be wearing either a face mask or cloth face covering. Um, there have been some, uh, there, there I think was a recent uh, publication where the question has been posed whether or not a face shield could 
potentially be used instead of a mask, but there have not been recommendations or guidance that have made um, to such. So we do recommend that anyone who is coming into a long-term care facility, a nursing home, um, should be wearing a, a cloth face covering or a face mask. A face shield um, can be worn in addition to that, but they should still be using a face mask or a cloth face covering. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the next question, so what is your recommendation for non-compliant COVID positive residents who are ambulatory? So Kara, is there any recommendation uh, for those types of residents that are still ambulatory and they're non-compliant? So this, I think this is definitely, these are residents that um, some of you may have more experience with than others. Um, and I would say that, you know, they, there may be residents who are non-compliant, but there are other, there also may be residents who, um, who don't understand. And so they aren't, I mean, technically non-compliant, but they aren't able to follow the recommended guidance because they don't understand or, um, they would have to be continuously reminded. And, and so what we, we have guidance that we, we do have um, an FAQ. Well, we have some, some material that um, is specific to memory care units. And I think that some of that information could possibly apply with other residents as well, where we recommend things like frequently reminding individuals, um, encouraging them to stay in their rooms, encouraging them to try to wear the cloth face covering or face mask, but we do, we do recognize that that may not always be feasible. Um, I would recommend, however, we do recommend, however, that any healthcare personnel should definitely be using their cloth face covering or face mask if they're providing resident care at all times. And, I, and if there are individuals who are non-compliant, are not cooperative, or for whatever reason are not able to follow those recommendations, it may be a situation where you have to encourage others to try to socially distance themselves from that person, for example. And feel free others to comment if you have suggestions on how, um, how uh, facilities may um, work with these residents. I do have another question from Susan Ayers, um, if no one wants to address that further issue. And she was wondering, how can you get tested or fit tested for the N95 mask? And she was also wondering who offers it, offers it and whether it should be renewed annually. And that can be for either of you. So this is Jane. I. Uh, I Ideally, fit testing should happen regularly. Um, I think it's every, certainly every year. It might be every six months. Um, I, I, that's a good question about whether there's an outside resource that can just come in and fit test everyone. Um, but yes, fit testing needs to be done regularly. So I can <laughs> look that up and get back to you. Yeah, this is Kara. I was going to add, I think it may be location dependent, Just and this is just more observation, things that I have heard from different places across the country. There are some areas where the health departments have been have had the resources um, to either help out or have put um, facilities in contact with others who were able to come in. That, that has not been the case across the board. Um, I have heard at least a couple examples of areas where they're close with hospitals and the hospitals were able to assist with that process. But again, it, it has not been across the board. So I encourage you to investigate whether that's something that's an option um, in your area, but agree that ideally fit testing is, you know, is um, happening. And then I will also add, I think I mentioned this, I can't remember if I mentioned this last week on the call um, as well, but there will be um, NIOSH and I believe OSHA, and there may be even someone from FDA, but there are a group of um, folks within CDC as well as other agencies who are working on putting together something specific to uh, respiratory protection programs and fit testing, um, trying to create some resources and answer some questions um, specific to long-term care. 
and that is something that I've heard that they are working on putting together for the month of July. So more information to come on that. Great. Thank you, Tara. Uh, this is a follow-up question to the team um, still asking about fit testing. Is there a certification that a nurse uh, must obtain in order to provide fit testing? And this is Karen. I actually I do not know the answer to that, but I will I will reach out. I I will reach out and ask our I I believe that so I believe you have you do have to be trained, but I don't know if there's a specific cert certification or certificate that you have to obtain in order to do that. Um, so that's that is the piece that I will have to find out about. Um, but I can definitely I can reach out to some of our NIOSH colleagues and um, ask them that. Uh, yeah, and this is Jane. I, there is there is training, and I, I agree with Kara. I don't know if there's certification. I worked in a manufacturing facility, and we um, had a fit testing program, um, and I believe we were required to do that by OSHA. Thank you, um, both Jane and Kara. Um, there have been several questions about reusing N95 masks, and people want to know what's the proper procedure for that, what is the storage, can they be reused? and or if they should be reused. So can you answer that, the best practice for um, the use of N95 masks or reuse of N95 masks and storage? Yeah, this is Kara. Um, there is definitely a lot more detail that you can find if you, I can give a, I will give um, some general information, but share that there is a lot more detailed information that you can find um, if you, uh, take a look at the CDC website. I know there's a lot of information, so it can sometimes be hard to find, but there is some information in the healthcare professionals section under the optimized PPE supply, and I'm pretty sure it's broken down by type of PPE, um, but um, there, so there, because of shortages, often N95s are needing to be reused or use has to be extended, um, and so, in those situations, some of the most important things, like if an N95 is being reused, some of the more important things that you need to remember are that you want to consider the front piece of that, that respirator to be contaminated. So you have to be very cautious in um, trying to avoid touching your respirator and in um, making sure that you're performing hand hygiene when you do remove that. Um, performing hand hygiene before as well as performing hand hygiene after. Um, the recommendation has been if you are reusing it to store it in a sealable paper bag. I've, I've had a lot of questions about what exactly that means. Essentially, essentially the recommendation has been in a, a, a paper bag, a sealable paper bag that you could just you could fold over and 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 um, you know fold over the edge and close. Um, Making sure, though, that you are performing hand hygiene, you're avoiding touching your face without performing hand hygiene. Um, when you are extending the use, meaning that you're using it throughout the day, potentially keeping it on for the care of numerous different patients or residents, you can do that. And that really, again, depends on where you're at in terms of your, your N95 supply. But you, again, want to make sure that you are trying to avoid touching that and adjusting it. Um, and that you are um, making sure to perform hand hygiene again before you are, are donning and doffing that respirator. Great, thank you so much, Kara. So I think we do have time for uh, maybe one to two more questions. Um, so the next question, um, and I'll pose this to Kara as well. Can you please describe the difference in PPE use between quarantine and isolation, especially when a resident is under observation for admission uh, slash readmission? Sure. So right now, really, you the the quickest answer, the easiest answer to that question is that the recommendations are actually the same. Um, and the reason for that is that you have individuals who are isolated, who you know have COVID-19, and you are using 
all of what we're calling, you know, the recommended COVID-19 PPE, meaning that you have gloves, you have a, a gown, you have an N95 respirator or face mask if you don't have a respirator, and you have eye protection, so goggles or a face shield. Um, for individuals who are being quarantined or you are observing them, the whole reason that you are doing that is because there, there is concern that they have potentially had an unknown exposure, that wherever they came from prior to coming to you, they have, or if it's a situation where you may have an outbreak, the concern is that those individuals could have been exposed and they may go on to develop the infection. And they may be infectious before they have symptoms or they may not develop symptoms at all. So you would care for them in the same PPE, the gloves, the gown, the N95 respirator or face mask and eye protection because they might develop the infection and you might not know it yet because you're between testing or haven't tested them yet. Um, so it's the same thing. The only difference would be that in situations where you are at specifically crisis capacity level with your PPE, there may be some strategies that would be okay to use for those individuals who have confirmed COVID-19 who are in a dedicated unit. There are some things that you may possibly do, things like, um, in, things like uh, extending the use of a gown, for example, um, in, in you know, crisis situations that we would not recommend outside of a COVID-19 unit. But otherwise, the basic recommendation for PPE is the same for both of those settings. Thanks. Thank you thanks so, so much. much. Sorry, go ahead, Angel. <laughs> I was just going to say thank you, Kara and Sophia. Do we have time for any more questions? I think that that is the end of the Q&A for today. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, so we would like for you to join us for the next nursing home training call on Thursday, July 2nd, 2020, from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time uh, on Transparency Resident and Family Notification. So please register for the training through the QIO program website, uh, which is listed here on the slide. Next slide. Sophia. Thank you so much, Angel. Please take a moment to complete the post-event assessment, and you'll see the link here um, for Survey SurveyMonkey. We'll use that information to provide and improve on future events. If your question wasn't answered today, we will have answers available for these questions on, post on our QIOprogram.org. And I believe that is it for today. Thank you.